Today, I don't want to waste any time because I do. I feel like God's put a word on my heart. And the title of my message today is Voices. The irony is this week, I've literally, as I said, had none. I was calling Dr. Jason in the house. I was like, I need an ENT. I think I am not yours. Pray for me. And I just went to war. Honestly, I fasted, mainly because I couldn't eat. (laughs) But also because I just believe that when the enemy comes to steal and take something, he comes for the very thing that he knows that God's about to use. So I'm very grateful to be able to be speaking today. Even my kids, I went into Costco, which is a regular occurrence for me. I love Costco. I have a membership. They know my car. I have a a driving spot that's kind of like for me. They love me at Costco. And um, I went in there. In fact, one lady was like, are you, uh, what do you call that thing when people do it for a living? Yeah, No, are you a, what do you call, Instacart person? I'm like, no, this is all for me. Thank you. (laughs) And then another lady, because I always go with my three kids. Come on, bless the Lord. Um, They're like, you're really patient. You just have this peaceful spirit about you. I'm like, you don't know me. (laughs) I wish you saw me at home. Get those shoes off. Get in the bathroom. You know, so I'm just so grateful for the opportunity. And I don't know about you, but I feel like God is doing something on the earth. And there's a lot of it to do with actually who we surround ourselves with. How many of you know that the people that you surround yourself with is the most important thing? And we have so many sayings around it, right? Kind of like you have to be really careful about who you go, who you hang out with, choose your friends wisely. There's lots of sayings. Another one that I know is show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Another one, misery loves company. That's right. And so today is a culture message. Today is about who we are as a house and what we believe God is wanting to do on the earth through this house. And that includes you and that includes me. And that's why community in the house of God exists. That's why building team in the house of God exists, because we want you to have the opportunity to build the right voices around your life. Create a space where there are, you know, so often you're just like, I just want to know where to go to find the good ones. And by the grace of God, there are no perfect people. (laughs) But we can create a space where we are being intentional. And everyone that walks into this space is being intentional. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about it because Max spoke so beautifully last week. There are lots of things vying for our attention. There are voices are important and we need to be very careful who we let into our circles. And there are lots of different voices wanting our attention. And they pay the top money for it. There's algorithms for it. Bad relationships are the different voices. We have also companies that are trying to take, think, give us things that we know we don't need, but it's the, it's the very thing in the front of our minds. Social media influences, I love them. I've got so many shoes and jeans and all this stuff because they told me it was, they're obsessed. They're, I'm, I'm obsessed. I love it so much, I'm obsessed. That's what we're listening to these days. And your voice, I've come to tell you today that your voice is important your very voice that God has given you. It's a force, a weapon. Your voice is a gift that God has placed within you. But it's not just important to use it, guys. We have to know how. How to use this gift, this voice that God has given each and every one of us. So I'm going to pray, and I pray that as we get into this word, it's going to be a lot. So get ready. And I wish we had way more time because there's so much in there's so much in this. But Holy Spirit, come. Father God, let your voice be the loudest in the room today. God, we never want to take for granted the omniscient one, the all-knowing, all-powerful, the reason why we're here. So help us, God that everything that happens in these next few moments aligns to your glory that lifts the banner of your name 
and use me, God, however you see fit. In Jesus' name. Amen. I have a beautiful friend of mine. Her name is Laura. Laura is one of the first friends I met when I was in London, and I committed myself to be a part of a beautiful church out there. Laura was a very, very talented, uh, popular individual, but she had a gift. She had a voice. Oh my gosh, did she have a voice, a beautiful singing voice, acting voice, all the, all the voices. But the voice that I appreciated the most was her voice of friendship over my life. There were so many times that I was struggling with affirmation, knowing who I was in Christ, not necessarily in the midst of people, but just dealing with stuff that I'd gone through. I remember Laura saw me, saw my life, saw the things that had been going on, and I was telling with some of the girls, it wasn't until I was 26 that someone actually decided to have a birthday party for me. I have since had some great birthday parties. Don't, it's nothing to do with, you know, but it, I, it was just a big deal. I'd never celebrated my birthday. And this girl went out and just pulled out all the stops and gave me a beautiful birthday. And I was so, so still to the, to the day, I was so shocked and so scared that no one would come that I left my own birthday party because it was just such a deep thing. But also, Laura was a generous spirit. She was a generous voice, always giving. Even to this day, we have, we've got kids, we're going through life. Every time I have a child, there's a package on my door. She has an encouraging spirit. She is that person. And I believe that God placed her in my life for a purpose. Her voice held value, held weight, and proved itself worthy. And so we're going to read about a, a, someone in the Bible that God does that with today. But Max last week spoke about something so beautiful, about distraction. You know, so often we talk about that. So many things trying to distract us. But can I tell you what my take home from that was? That truly, that if I don't get right what I give my attention to, not just what I take away not just the distractions, but what I give my attention to, I will lose power and authority in the things that God is wanting to do in my life. I will lose it because my attention is not focused. And so that, my friend, I believe is not just for our house, but a prophetic word for the day that we're living in. God is wanting to build a generation So we must be careful to take to attention and not be distracted. We have to channel it. I believe the church, God is, I believe as a church that God is calling us to go back to his word, his heart, his voice. And if you're looking to hear from God today, it won't be far away from what's already in here. So let's go to this word. And let's see what he has to say for us. We're going to go to the story of Zechariah. Because God is in the habit of using people. And there are multiple voices that God has in store for us today. But as I was going through this week, we actually spent a bit of time with a friend of ours this week earlier. And he went to the story of Zechariah. And I can't get myself out of it. Because there was so much. It was so rich. And in the last days, powers will come and go. But how many believe that the church will keep standing? So we have to be careful what voices we let in and what voices we cultivate in the house of God. And there are four specific voices that I felt in my spirit God is wanting to raise up in this very house, in you. The shepherd voice, the prophetic voice, the apostolic voice, and the teaching voice. God is wanting to raise up people who are not afraid to do the work of discipleship. It's not easy. God is working us through the prophetic voice, people who have proven themselves, heard from the voice of God, and willing to carry the authority of heaven through doing the hard work, aligning people back to the heart of God, challenging the current way, and encouraging us towards the glorious hope that he has. 
for each and every one of us. God wants the apostolic voice to rise. People who are already doing God's work to stand behind, look behind and say, who can I bring along? Who can I help recalibrate into the kingship that I'm already standing in? God is calling the teaching voices. People who are passionate about the knowledge of God and who want to speak and walk in the, and point to the truth. And I'm not talking about standing on a pulpit, guys. I'm talking about knowing God's word and using it to align the people around us in every day's life. Knowledge, power. So we'll go to Zechariah. And I'm going to read the entire chapter. It's 17 voices, so don't hate the player. But in this, in the Bible, in this, we're going to talk about two of the voices that I just spoke about. We're going to talk about the shepherd voice and the prophetic voice. Zechariah in himself was a prophet, but this story is about a shepherd. And in the Bible, prophets are humans who speak on the, on behalf of God. And some of their messages are more dramatic than others, like Ezekiel in this story and Zechariah. They see elaborate visions. They have a word. And God gives it to them through a dream or anything or, or some environment or some experience. And then others are just a call, a simple call for people to come back, to remember the allegiance to the God of Israel and to come back and worship the God of the Bible. So I'm going to read this word and we're going to fly through it. So Zechariah is speaking on behalf of God. Open the doors, O Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Wail, O Cyprus, for the cedar has fallen, for the glorious trees are ruined. Wail, oaks of Bashan, for the thick forest has been felled. The sound of the wail of the shepherds, for for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of Jordan is ruined. Talking about the house of God and how the beauty of his presence and the union with God has fallen apart. And the shepherds who are meant to be looking after the the flock have fallen. Thus says the Lord, become a, become, thus says the Lord, my God, become shepherd of the flock doomed to slaughter. Those who buy them, slaughter them and go unpunished. Those who sell them say, bless the Lord. I have become rich, and they and and their own shepherds have no pity on them, for I will no longer have pity on the inhabitants of this land, declares the Lord. Behold, I will cause each of them to fall into the hand of his neighbor and each into the hand of his king, and they will crush the land, and I will deliver them for their from their hands again. The the shepherds have fallen by the wayside, and they've gone after the wrong things. So I became a shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered. How many know that when there's no shepherd, the flock scatters, right? So I became the shepherd of the flock, doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders. And I took two staff, one I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. And in one month, I destroyed the three bad shepherds, paraphrase so that you understand but I became impatient with them and they also detested me them being the flock I I, as the shepherd became impatient and they detested me so I said I will not be your shepherd what is to die let it die what is to be destroyed let it be destroyed and let those who are left devour the flesh of one another I'm done with you all I'm out and I took my staff called favor, and I broke it, annulling the covenant that I'd made with the peoples. So it was annulled on that day. And the sheep traders who were watching me knew it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out my wages, 30 pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver, profit, talking about the people of God and how much it costs to sell the flock mirroring that to what happened with Jesus and Judas, right? I've lost my way. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. 
the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Then I broke my second staff, union, annulling the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. I broke the unity in the flock. Then the Lord said to me, take once more the equipment of a foolish shepherd. For behold, I'm raising up a land, a shepherd who does not care for those who are being destroyed or seek the young or heal the maimed or nourish the healthy, but devours the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hooves. God told him to become a foolish shepherd and not care for the people. Woe to my worthless shepherd who deserts the flock. May the sword strike his arm, his right eye, let his arm be wholly withered, his right eye utterly blinded. How encouraged are you today? But God really cares about being a shepherd. And it's not easy. One of the voices that God is calling to rise in this house is the shepherd voice. And guess what? God has called every single one of us to it. It's not a leadership thing. God is working his people and is telling us what it looks like when we don't have a shepherd in the house of God. We all know what it's like to live. You know, the the Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Without vision, the people perish. God knows how important it is to have shepherds to align the flock. So watch out today. Because it's really easy to live like a sage, lofty, out of reach. It's easy to not be a shepherd. Call yourself a shepherd and not do the hard work. Because we're trying to influence people and we're trying to peacock with information with no authority. That's not what God's calling us to as a church. We don't want a church of information. We want shepherds discipleship, people who are willing to do the hard work of discipleship, revelation of service, have that deep in us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be called a worthless shepherd because guess what? He's calling all of us to that in this day and age. I want to be a valuable shepherd. And what does a valuable shepherd looks like? look like? Let's go back to verse 16. It says it in the opposite term, but it's actually telling us what they should have been doing and what they weren't. Verse 16, for behold, I'm raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those being destroyed or seek the young or heal the maimed or nourish the healthy. God wants us to care for those being destroyed, the broken, the hurting, the weak, the ones with no hope. He wants us to seek the young the next generation, the babies, the ones who are green in their faith, baby Christians. He wants us to heal the maimed. You know, the ones that used to be strong, but then they just, a few things happened and they fell along the way. You know, the story of sheep, right, with shepherds, when they keep running off, there's always that one sheep that keeps running off and the shepherd has to go get it. You know, the story of leaving the 99. But what actually happens in real life, some of us may know this, is that the shepherd, if he sees a sheep that's actually doing that continually, he breaks the legs of the sheep and then he carries it around his neck. And what happens is to that sheep is that it starts working, looking at at the cadence of what is, where is my shepherd going? What is important to him? What is the path that he wants me to be on? But then what also happens is that their heart, the heart of the sheep and the heart of the shepherd actually start moving in cadence because they start knowing the heart of each other. God wants us to care for the maimed, heal the maimed, heal the broken, nourish the healthy. You know, you can walk in here and be like, I'm good. But we need to create a space where no one ever stops growing because actually no one knows all there is to know about the God that we serve. And there is always more in the house of God. Every single one of us has a next step. And God has a purpose for each and every one of our lives. You know, I believe that we live in a a world today where society has downplayed holiness and watered it down to an option for life for boring people. 
Holiness is not an option in the house of God. It's a mandate. God is calling each and every one of us. He's commanding us. 1 Peter 1.16, be holy as I am holy. So God is not asking us, and it's not easy, obviously. We know that this is not an easy call, but there is grace. But you know what? The standards never change. And in fact, I believe that the standard of God is lifting higher. He's raising his standard. God is calling us to shepherd his flock, and he's raising the standard. Isaiah 59, 19 says, So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. The Spirit of God will lift up a standard against him. God is calling us to meet him at that standard so we can fight. Because ah, God uses people. God uses people. And that's why we are here. So firstly, we need a shepherd voice. We all need that person in our lives. So I'm asking you today to take note. Who are these people? Every single one of us needs this voice in your life today or do the work to get yourself there. We need that shepherding voice, the one that's caring for you, seeking you out, healing you, nourishing you when you're good, being that person in your life. Secondly, we need that prophetic voice. Do you have proven trustworthy voices that you know have heard from God? They carry the authority of heaven to align you back to his heart, challenge you in the current ways that you think and give you a better word, encouraging you towards the glorious hope in Christ and do the work with you. Can I encourage you, church? We have to do the work of finding those people. And they're right here. They're in this room. Every single one of you has that opportunity today. Could be the answer to your prayer. Three-minute mingle. Don't misunderstand it. It's not just flighty. It could be holy if you choose it to be. Thirdly, an apostolic voice. The ones who are already living out God's call on their lives and then wanting to guide other people into that headship. I talk about this often. Apostles was not a holy word. It was actually an army general. So that when the king of a nation overthrows the land, he sends his apostles to go in first to recalibrate that kingship to the new kingdom. That's an apostle. So who's gone before you? Who are your mentors that you look at that are a few steps ahead that can help recalibrate your thinking? The voice that's just like, I'm here, come on down. Lastly, you know, I, just before I say this, lastly, a teaching voice. The ones who are passionate about the knowledge of God, who want to walk with and point you to truth. It's similar to discipleship, but it's about, I'm going to say this clearly, that the shepherd voice is who are you caring for? The teaching voice is who's caring for you? Who's discipling you? We all need those voices. And although the Hebrew word, and I want to say this, there's lots of Hebrew words. There's lot, you know, we can talk about what it means to be a teacher. And so often we think about it and we think, oh, it's just me with all my knowledge and information. And then I can, bye, see you. Um, I can, I can palm my information off to someone else. But in the Old Testament, there were two words that meant teacher. One was yara, which means to point out. The other was lamad, which is to goad. Who knows what I mean when I say goad? Literally, shepherd sheep, shepherd staff, guiding the sheep. <laughs> Literally, did, do I have, did I have to do that? No, but I did it anyway. Is it, you, you want me, baby. Um, <laughs> the shepherd staff. That's what it is to goad someone, to teach, is to guide, to help, 
nourish and create a path for them. Don't go that way. This is what the knowledge of God, this is the knowledge of God. I know it looks a little, I know it that looks similar, but it's not because this is what is that that's don't go too far that way. Don't go too far. That's teaching in the New Testament. It was more things like to teach, to instruct systematically, to train disciples, to instruct, to correct, to counsel, to command, to order, to hand down tradition. Who are you teaching today? Who has your DNA today? From here. <laughs> let's, let's, let's keep it calibrated. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Hosea 4, 6. It actually says this, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of God, I will forget your children. Ha! Huh? When I read that as a Nigerian, you go like, ha, 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 That's a Nigerian way of dealing with that. It's like, oh my gosh, I don't want that. I don't want that for my children. God sees. True knowledge cannot be, you can't fake it. And not only that, not just me faking it to you, but between God and me. I cannot fake knowledge. And so when God is saying that we perish for lack of knowledge and he's going to take away the thing that he wants to give us in power and authority, it's doing it actually for our protection. And as a church, guys, we're living in a generation where we cannot afford to throw away our next generation for lack of knowledge. So how are you getting into this word? Not because you need a five-minute pick-me-up, but because of the sake of the generations coming after you. How are you going into this word? Not because you need something to fix a situation in your life, but because you know that 50 years from now, if you don't learn this word properly, the people God has connected to your life at work, in your home, in your family will not get it and it won't be passed down beyond you. That's the church that we're in today. That's what we're building. Congratulations. Tag your it for the future, for the generations to come. Can you name these people? Take a minute. Who are the right voices in your life today? Can you visualize them? And can I say this? 99% of the voices that you need in your life won't come to you. They won't come to you. You have to go get it. Because oftentimes they're going about the work. And it's not just one person for a million people. It's here. There are mentors in this room that God has put in this place for you. But you have to discover them. And no one is exempt. No one. No one is walking around. No one should be walking around thinking that they've got nothing to learn from a room. No one. Because that's the house of God. That's how he's created us to be. So I just want to take a minute today and I just want to talk about what it looks like, the, the principle of sowing and reaping. We talk about it often because I think so often we think that it's really easy to just sit in a season where we just want reap. I just want my people. I just want to have the people around me. Guess what? The work of sowing is going to take longer than the reaping. So when we're looking for these voices, please know that it's not going to happen overnight. If we put up the, let's put up the second picture, the one that's just general of sowing and reaping. I was just researching, I was just looking at actually when you sow and reap in the land, what does that look like? Uh, maybe the other one first. Before you get to harvest, you have to prepare, you have to plant, and then you have to protect. And then you have this small season of harvest. It's actually not all equal, but there's way more time sowing and way more time cultivating and way more time doing the work than actually receiving. Second picture, if you look at this picture, and I believe God works in agriculture. God loves agriculture, right? Jesus loves agriculture. Like January to December, Really, if you look at it, there's only two, no, 
Yeah, two months of harvesting. And then the rest is sowing and cultivating and protection and all the things. God is saying, I believe that through this, we can see that we really do have to do the work of sowing and reaping. But sowing is not going to be for the faint of heart. It might mean five steps forward, ten steps back, three steps forward, one step back. And then hopefully by the end of it, the, the greater culmination is that we're living in a community full of apostle voices, shepherding voices, prophetic voices, voices that know the word of God and are able to teach with power and authority day to day, not just here. In fact, probably less so here, from here. It's not a pulpit thing that I'm talking about. It's a lifestyle. So I want to take a minute and I want to pray because I believe that God is not just calling you to find those voices, but to be that voice. And if you don't know who you are today, I actually think your first step is to understand how God's wired you. How has he wired you to be? When we do Willan Essentials, we do this thing called the spiritual gifts test. It's not an all in all. And I've got the, if you want to start there, take the test. Understand how you're wired. I can promise you today, we've already done the Alan Essentials so many times that there are prophets in the room. We have to do the work. We have to cultivate this, these skills. There are apostles in the room. There are shepherds in the room. There are teachers in the room. And God is saying today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get serious about what he wants to do on the earth, to develop the right voice. Use your voice, but know how to use it. Have a voice, but know what God is wanting to do through you. And then create an army around you to call out the, those gifts, to kick you in the right direction if you need to, to encourage you as you are doing everything that God has placed on your life. That is the church of Jesus Christ. That is the church that God is coming back for, that the gates of hell will not prevail. And I know that I know that I know each and every one of us has the potential to have that voice. Every one of us. Every single one of us, even the ones that feel completely inadequate right now, because we're in that broken, maimed, need help, need care, need, in that situation. Those who are strong will help you so that one day you can be strong and help others in Jesus' name. So let's pray. And there's not going to be any music or anything fully to take your attention or to make you feel holy, but I just believe God is coming for you by name today. And he wants to cultivate your voice. And he wants to show you what voice you have and then give you the opportunity to use your voice in a healthy environment. So Holy Spirit, this isn't for anyone in particular because I know that each and every one of us needs to be a voice and needs to have a voice. God, I pray right now that your power of revelation sits with each and every one of us today that we're able to fully grasp what it is that you have, the purpose, your purpose that you have aligned us to, that you have gifted us for. I'm praying that the prophetic voice in the Lan Church rises. I'm praying that the apostolic, the, the apostle voice rises. I'm praying that the shepherds rise in Jesus' name that want to care for the young, reach out for the maimed, the brokenhearted, nurture the healthy. I'm praying, Holy Spirit, that you help the teachers in the room to cultivate the skill that you've given them for service, not for accolades. And I pray that each and every one of us can have that circle around us 
so that we can be everything that you've called us to be, so that we can run the race, do your work. And then there are people that don't even know who you are, Jesus, that don't know this God, this Jesus that we are speaking about, that have no idea how to use their voice because they don't know how they're wired, because they don't even know what you did, what you paid for for them. And if that's you today, I want to say this. There's this really incredible thing that you may not know (laughs) has the power to take you out, and it is sin. And sin has the power to take everything that God has put in your life and kill it and whip it out. And God doesn't want that for your life. But it takes understanding that Jesus Christ came onto this earth. All these prophets, all these voices point to Jesus, that he is the risen Savior, that he can come in and recalibrate us to this God that died for your sins. And so today, you have an opportunity to either meet him for the first time or come back, come home. And so to anyone who wants to do that today, I want to say a prayer. And I want to ask that each and every one of us to close our eyes and give everyone room in this room privacy. Because God came for you, by name, for you, for you, for you, for me. And you're probably in this room because he's still coming after you, and he's creating a space for you to make the decision to come home. So I'm just going to count to three, and if that's you, you just want to start this this journey with Christ, or you want to come back, just take a minute. And just speak to your heavenly father, however it may look. And we're going to say a prayer in a moment. But I just want you to put your hand up and join me in just acknowledging that this God, it, that you want to start this journey. And I'm just going to count to three. And you can just put your hand up and we'll pray. And it really is that simple. One, two, Today is a day. It's a really great day for salvation in Jesus' name. Three. If there's anyone in the room, thank you. Thank you. I want us to recalibrate their relationship with God. I love that. And together as a family, we're just going to say this prayer. Nothing fancy. It's just the beginning of a journey. Say, Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I know that I have sinned and come short. Today I want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. I pray you make me new. You change me from the inside out. For your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. I'm so grateful. Thank you, Jesus.